Hi, everyone, again, and thanks for promptly returning from the pretty short break. I hope my loud voice um, scared everybody into their seats. My name is Tracy Fox. I'm president of Food, Nutrition, and Policy Consultants. Um, in the previous session, we heard quite a bit about established projects and policies and strategies across a spectrum of venues and also at the spectrum of levels, national, state, and local levels. In this session, we'd really like to kind of spend some time exploring some um, innovative strategies that have been going on around the country in different parts and considering how they're um, formed, implemented, evaluated, what are some of the challenges, what are some of the opportunities um, that we all see, um, certainly in this new dynamic political environment, I think, um, suffice it to say, we're going to certainly continue the fight at the national, state, and local level, but I think there's also going to be a lot of opportunities for innovations at the local level that sort of go beyond or under the radar from policy, and we're going to hear a little bit about some of that today. Um, this session is going to be structured a little differently than the previous ones. We're going to have two talks followed by a facilitated discussion similar to the previous ones, and then we're going to move on to a separate panel discussion um, and keep submitting your questions so we will have a discussion right after the two speakers that I'll introduce shortly. Um, so the two speakers, first we have Henrietta Sandoval Soland from Community Outreach Patient Empowerment Project, yet another acronym, but this one you just simply have to remember COPE, we can all remember that these days, <laughs> who will be talking about the process of developing a strategy <laughs> to promote water in the Navajo Nation. Um, and another little fun fact about Henrietta, how many of you have read the bios is you're not going to really be graded on it too much so well good then you don't know this about Henrietta but I do Henrietta is actually the the first female Native American New Mexican state police officer and she's also a retired judge so not only are we going to be um, enlightened with the work she's doing with COPE but we're going to feel really protected here today so um, and then after Henrietta Marlene will Marlene Schwartz um, is the Red Center it was with what executive director of the Red Center for Food Policy and Obesity, who will be discussing some of a multifaceted initiative um, that she's been involved in um, that's taking place currently in Howard County, Maryland, just north of here. So with that, I'll turn it over to Henrietta. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I, I've kind of been in a circle with my career and you know my past uh, experiences really led me to where I am today you know I, I moved from state government into the nonprofit world and it was a big shift for me because I couldn't go out and arrest people or or do a JNS on people anymore it was a, it was a whole new feel for me but uh, thank you again so culturally um, uh, most Native Americans introduced themselves in their condition um, Traditional way, so Tachitni Nishle Tohana Bashishin, Klitz Chitni Dashiche Ado, Toha Glini Dasha Nale. So Native Americans are born into clans, and most of the clans are on the maternal side. So I was born to my mother, red running into water. I was born for my father uh, near the water clan. So um, it makes sense that I'm here today to talk about water first in our COPE initiative. Um, with uh, our program. So COPE program was founded in 2009. It's a 501c nonprofit organization. We primarily seek to eliminate health disparities, improve the well-being of American Indian and Alaska Natives on Navajo land. So uh, just to give you an over overview of the Navajo Nation, it's the um, largest tribe in the U.S. population and in land base. We have more than uh, 170,000 tribal members uh, that all reside within a 27,000 square mile um, area. It involves or covers the areas of New Mexico, Arizona, and Utah. Um, like a lot of uh, tribal lands, um, Navajo, you know, has the uh, issues of poverty, unemployment, and income uh, compared to those nationally. So 
Uh, COPE's primarily focus is to um, work toward healthy food access, cancer care, educational outreach, and diabetes. We believe that the power to overturn these long-standing historical health inequalities lies inherently within the communities themselves. Themselves by so by investing in community resources and aligning our work within the vision of the tribal leaderships and those leaders within the communities, we really hope to begin that transformation toward uh, healthier choices. So in October of 2016, uh, COPE was fortunate to be awarded a grant through the MB3 Foundation. Um, and if I could add that the MB3 Foundation is the only national Native American nonprofit organization. Um, so our hope here and our, our work along with MB3 is to reduce sugar sweetened beverages consumption among Native children. Uh, we all know that of course, water helps regulate the body temperature and maintains uh, bodily functions. Uh, so uh, the group, these are the awardees. There's nine tribes uh, spread throughout New Mexico and Arizona, all on Navajo Nation. We're really working as a group collaboratively, each though, each, although each uh, cohort or each tribe is in a certain area on Navajo Nation. We're working to address childhood obesity and type 2 diabetes through health and physical activity. Um, we're looking at other investments and other strategies throughout Indian Country. So this close-knit group, a cohort, we're working together or we will work the next two and a half years together uh, conducting assessments of sweet sugary sugar sweetened beverages consum consumption, uh, access to safe drinking water, and breastfeeding. So these assessments that each team will be working on will help identify the important um, uh, areas and help implement policy and system change. Um, as I indicated, we're a close working network. Uh, we meet, we're gonna meet at least eight times, convene together um, to see how the uh, project is um, progressing to share ideas and strategies with one another. At the end of the project, our our goal is to, along with the MV3 Foundation, is to launch a national campaign to educate and inform uh, the public and reduce the consumption of, of SSB on Indian land. So uh, just a brief overview of the cohort. We have the five Sandoval Indian Pueblos. They're directly working with the WIC community and uh, targeting breastfeeding. We have the Jemez Pueblo. They're working on policies and uh, practice. Mescalera Apache. They're working directly with he the youth on health education and various activities involving youth. We have the Rama Navajo School Board. Uh, implementing policies and curriculum. The Santo Domingo Pueblo, they're taking a holistic approach to uh, community-based approach, uh, addressing water and breastfeeding. We have the Star School uh, in the area of Flagstaff, Arizona. They're working uh, with three local uh, native communities on obtaining clean access to water and also implementing an education program within the school. The Tamea Wellness Center, uh, they're looking at changing the community attitude and social norms. Uh, they're doing that through education, marketing, and policy work. And then we have the Zuni Pueblo Youth Enrichment Program, and their uh, main focus is hydration for health, uh, working directly with the youth and implementing uh, filling stations within the community, mostly at community parks. So uh, COPE, as I had indicated, our work with the MB3 Foundation is to increase access to safe drinking water. We're working with families, uh, the Head Starts, community health representatives, the Navajo chapter houses, uh, and just to give you uh, uh, kind of a visual uh, uh, to the land population. There's five ad agencies within the Navajo Nation, and they have about 110 chapters. So, you know, although that's a, a large amount, we're 
we're outreaching to some of the chapters that we can, you know, reach. Um, so we're really looking at that shift toward healthier choices. Um, a little bit more about a background, you know, and how the Water First is working, it, which aligns with the 2014 Diné Nation Act. Um, the Navajo Nation passed this act, uh, a 2% tax on unhealthy foods, including sugary beverage, beverages. And the revenue that's being collected from it is really being invested back into community development around health and wellness. Um, when this act was first brought up, the, the president at the time, uh, President Shelley with the Navajo Nation, had actually um, vetoed this legislation. Uh, he was concerned with the definitions of junk food and the monitoring of the tax collections. So he called the Healthy Diné Nations Act uh, progressive and was asked the, asked the legislators for a further clarification. So then um, it came back and he actually passed that into law. So the revenues, as I indicated, are, are generated from sales tax. They're used for the community wellness centers, uh, such as farming, uh, vegetable garden, greenhouses, farmers markets, clean water, exercise equipment, and health classes, and a few more. So, um, you know, a lot of the local chapters are are now implementing the 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 money that's uh, that's been distributed to them to really target the communities within their area. Um, as I had indicated, uh, we work uh, we work along with uh, Christina Heck. She spoke earlier this morning with the National Drinking Water Alliance. Alliance. Uh, we really take into consideration a lot of the policy and the input they have uh, to move forward with our initiative. So this is kind of a, an overview of our timeline since awarded the MB3 Water First Grant. Uh, in October, the grant was awarded. We've been working on a needs assessment phase, which is coming to an end shortly. So now we're gathering all the information that we've obtained. And from July to September of 2008, we'll work on the implementation process. Um, in February 2017, uh, the NB3 Foundation put on a healthy beverage summit. The summit, of course, brought together all the community members, uh, different organizations and ed uh, agencies that were all committed to the same thing, you know, reducing SSP beverages among na Native American children uh, in New Mexico and Arizona. So the summit was really aimed to be a collaborative effort to bring together uh, these organizations uh, to learn from one another uh, and most importantly to work with one another sharing ideas and um, discussing challenges. So prior to the summit, the cohort uh, met uh, and talked about our next steps forward with the um, water initiative grant. Uh, so the COPE program was able to, through our community ass assessment, uh, we, were, we made a quick YouTube video of an elderly woman uh, and she provides a lot of her insights on past experiences in r relation to water and food. Uh, we felt that it was really important to uh, include her input because uh, we want to make sure that we're um, listening to those tr to, to the traditional knowledge of our elders. Um, so that's the site there. Okay. We discovered through our assessment that most of the community members on Navajo um, are, are visual learners, so the surveys that we given were kind of long and extensive, and you know, by showing more visual pictures, uh, they were able to uh, attain that message to to see the benefits of, of drinking water 
and you know, of course, relaying that the message that water is actually the healthiest choice. So to conduct our needs assessment, we had to develop a strategy map. And we kind of looked in, in different four areas, four action areas. We wanted the perceptions of our community members, you know, what their thoughts were around children's health, water, uh, SSB, and breastfeeding. We also turned, as I indicated, to the elders to find the traditional knowledge. We wanted to incorporate our work to keep it culturally sensitive. Uh, we looked at their strengths, um, the strengths within the community, uh, what are the community, you know, where is that community at at this time? We looked at issues, of, you know, what's happening now, um, you know, around SSB water and breastfeeding. And then, of course, we're always looking and in, in partnering with folks uh, that we can uh, work with to make this initiative and this process, the project, more successful. So the previous, um, the previous slide, you know, I talked a little bit about the action states. So the, the data that was collected from the surveys, the interviews, the focus groups, and community meetings really centered back to land and water um, that was related to food policy and system change. Uh, a lot of the community members felt that, you know, culturally water is, is sacred and it's used in, in many ways besides uh, drinking, cooking, but used uh, in ceremonial practices. So we we're really looking at returning to our first nourishments in life uh, and focusing on moving from breast milk to water. Um, so looking at this cycle here of land and water, um, this cycle kind of helped develop the, uh, well, it did help develop the uh, policy on the Diné Food of Life. Uh, we partnered with the Harvard Law Policy Clinic uh, to create this food policy on a Navajo nation. So it's kind of structured in different uh, areas, you know, in this cycle, the food production, processing, distribution, waste, food access, and nutrition education. Um, it covers areas of uh, the structure of the Navajo government, the roles that uh, federal and state government plays in, in in according to food policies, food production, uh, the, the, the entire cycle, and um, food assistant projects in school and food education. So uh, the next few slides here are gonna kind of go over some of the data that we've collected, not all, but just uh, key points on a few, um, and as I indicated earlier, we looked at the uh, Na Navajo Nation chapters. We actually were able to conduct surveys in uh, five chapter areas, and this really helped us to see, you know, where were we not focusing on and what areas that we needed more improvement on. So out of 59 surveys, 29% uh, were male, 50, 71 were female, and each individual, um, who took the survey, you know, th their ha average household size was four. Um, so in the area of Navajo traditional influences on food and beverages, these are some of the comments that we received at the end of the survey, you know, which you know, really took to heart on what we need to look for and how we need to focus. It, uh, some of the comments were, it has influenced me culturally. We used to plant corn, melon, be beans, squash, and we were very healthy. Water was all we drank, and water was cold and clean and came down from the mountains. So we're really, you know, taking into consideration what the elderlies and what, what the community thought. Um, you know, even those those individuals who weren't raised traditionally, they're learning that the importance of of bringing back the traditional teachings and uh, bringing water back into into practice. Um, I, 
and one thing I, you know, I, I, I'll leave this up for a little bit for you so you can read, but you know, um, comments like, I think the old traditional way of cooking, preparing food were more healthy compared to now. These were some of the um, comments made, uh, written comments on Navajo in relation to water and health. You know, uh, and again, you can see that it brings back that cultural aspect of water is important to Mother Earth. It gives life and beautification and environment, life to the people and animals. So they, they, you can see that the importance of water, you know, uh, is, is still much alive on Navajo and it, within the, the beliefs of the folks. Um, in the last statement, water is my clan. We are water. We come from water. There are water beings we pray to. Our clan in particular makes water offerings in the will to ask for water during prayers. So I, I you know, just from listening to the f to folks, um, they were really sincere and they were really willing to make that shift away from um, sugar sweetened beverages and move back to a more healthier choice. So. Uh, the graph here, I'll, I'll just go really quickly, uh, kind of shows, you know, how often do you, you purchase bottled water or jug water? How often do you purchase hauled water for the household? So um, purchasing hauled, hauled water on the bottom chart is a little higher because a, the majority of the community members haul water primarily for livestock. Um, uh, uh, a few more comments on making your, making healthier food choices. Um, I wish my family could make some healthy food choices. That keeps them healthier. We have family gatherings and we don't make those healthy food choices. Family are very influential. So you can see that, you know, the folks still think deeply about uh, family and kinship. And, you know, and they, they all believe that food is medicine and you know, just by looking at this, that they, they are, you know, wanting to make that big switch, switch in, in change. Uh, here's another uh, graph about water consumption. Um, you know, how often do you drink water from sinks and water fountains? How often do you drink water that you purchase in bottles, jugs, or large containers? And, and this is kind of like a basic information, so we kind of have a, an overall idea, and it kind of starts from ne never to rarely all the way to three or more times a day. Um, and then some of the issues that around not drinking tap water, uh, you know, um, Christina had mentioned earlier about some of the sources of contamination, and as you can see, some people said, I don't like the taste, it smells, you know, it has a different color. So, you know, all of this, of course, will be taken into uh, consideration when we are moving forward. So, just to wrap up, you know, there was talk in the, in the morning session about incentives. What kind of incentives can we do to make this happen? Um, COPE is actually uh, working and currently running on a food voucher program. Uh, it's a FERX program, so I'm thinking we can probably bring this issue of water similar to what we're doing with the FERX program where we're wor working with local communities and we're also working with uh, local stores to bring healthier choices into the stores uh, using a voucher program. So COPE really believes that uh, it's important to develop our next phase on impl implementation to fit the needs of the community traditionally and culturally. Listening to community members and incorporating their ideas is the approach to take to communicating the me message on reducing the consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages. Thank you.